Greenwashing, the desire's equivalent of faking charity donations. Greenwashing is the practice of claiming a product as a sustainable improvement, while the actual improvement is small, non-existent, or in some cases, even worse than before. Obviously, this is bad. Not only can it fake sustainable progress, but it can also lead to false education about what's sustainable. Sometimes, designers and companies just lie about their environmental footprint. Other times, they just don't know what they're doing. They pick something that sounds sustainable, but the end impact is minimal or even negative. That's why I like taking the subjectivity out of design with data. And one of the best methods to design sustainably with data is life cycle assessment. That's right. Today, we're looking at the exciting world of life cycle assessment, how to use it as a designer, and how to make your designs actually more sustainable rather than just a marketing gimmick. With that, Let's go. So let's get started. Basically, when you create a new product, you make damage. So life cycle assessment is a way to check or calculate the potential or actual environmental impact of your problems. Basically, what you do is look at the entire process of creating, using, and throwing away a product and come up with some numbers that say how bad the environmental impact is. This is how you calculate carbon footprint along with a bunch of other environmental factors. Air, water, earth, heart, Captain Planet. So for instance, a group of researchers at MIT performed a life cycle assessment on a bunch of shoes. And in the end, they calculated that a pair of sneakers causes about 14 kilograms of carbon emission. Also importantly, LCA can give you a quantitative way to determine the impact of design changes and manufacturing changes. So for instance, using alternate materials like biodegradable or recycled or renewable. Let's try to design our own product using LCA and assess the impact along the way. The goal is going to be to lower the environmental footprint. And to keep this video manageable length, I'm just going to focus on carbon impact for now. Although there's a lot of other factors to look at. The first step is to start with a base design. So let's just start with a standard power bank. This is like a standard plastic shell power bank. Pretty much like every power bank kind of looks like this. If we assume someone in Europe is using this about twice a week to charge their iPhone, we can calculate the total carbon impact. Based on my calculations, I think this would be something around 11.8 kilograms CO2. Since the calculations are a bit complex, I'm just gonna focus on the result and not get the depths of my big Excel table. It's always good to do a little bit of the sanity checking and some other products in the same category. Based on these other products, I think we're probably in the right range. So from here, we can try out some different sustainable strategies and see if we can lower the carbon footprint. Power banks are pretty simple devices. They're pretty much some batteries and electronics and an enclosure holding everything together. So let's play with the enclosure a little bit. What if we try out some different forms to see if we can lower the carbon impact that way? So here I have some different kind of designs I'm trying out and playing around with. You know, instinctively, I kind of thought there'd be a little bit more impact here since these all use about similar amounts of plastic and have the same manufacturing processes. I think the impact of these is roughly going to be pretty close. I guess that's why we're doing this with numbers and not just me guessing. And since something really has a big impact, I think I'm just going to leave this standard shape. What if instead of changing the form, we try to optimize the amount of materials that are in this? For instance, we could reduce the enclosure material by about, let's say 30%. Then we could probably reduce the carbon impact. So we were about at 11.8 before, and now I think we've gotten it down to maybe around something like 11.3. That's pretty good. Spin, spin, spin. Hey, recycled materials are pretty popular right now. Why don't we try that out on our enclosure? Apparently switching from virgin to recycled ABS can lower the environmental impact by as much as 81%. At least that's what this Austrian company claims. So let's change this to recycled. Boop, boop. So it looks like we do lower the carbon footprint a bit. But since the enclosure is only a smaller portion of the impact of the overall product, any changes to the enclosure only affect a small portion of the total impact. And we're slowly lowering the carbon footprint overall, so it looks like we've already shaved off about a kilogram of CO2. Go us. Way to go, team. This is a team effort. I'm doing all the work. You can take credit. Classic. Corporate. 
project. Okay, so we've tried playing with the shell a bunch. What if we try to make this thing last longer? I think the plastic is going to be a failure point on this thing. So what if we make the case out of aluminum and then assume that we can double the lifetime of this product? So let's make this thing out of aluminum. Pretty slick stuff, I'd say. So actually, aluminum has a higher carbon impact because it's really intensive to mine and produce. Even with recycled aluminum, we're raising the carbon footprint of this product. But this isn't really comparing apples to apples. If we look at our plastic enclosure design, we do have a lower initial carbon impact but the product only lasts maybe about three years. But if we use aluminum, then the product's gonna last about maybe six years. That means in the timeline of using one aluminum power bank, we're gonna have to use two plastic power banks. Meaning that over six years, we're actually using less carbon impact than we would if we were using a plastic power bank. This is a drop of about 37%, which is a pretty good drop. Plus this aluminum power bank is pretty slick. This thing is looking good already. Oh yeah. Okay, so of over six years, we caused about 14.8 kilograms of CO2. That means in the three years, it's roughly equivalent to seven and a half kilograms CO2. That's a big jump. So why don't we try some more sustainable things out? What about repairability? After the case, the next point of failure, I think is gonna be batteries. The batteries only last a certain amount of time, a certain amount of charges before they eventually run out. So if I have my power bank and I add a little handle to the design, I can easily pull out the batteries when it's time to change them and replace them as needed. No problem. This means that we can continue to use the same enclosure and same electronics, but replace the batteries as they get old and need to be replaced. This is the most annoying 3D print prototype sound. So again, I actually am increasing the carbon footprint of the design, but just like before, if we look at a longer timeline, we actually start seeing the benefit of the product. So getting a little closer, we lower the impact by a bit more and it's looking pretty good. There's also a couple notes on how to improve the amount of people that actually repair this thing. It's important to use standard parts I used standard 18650 batteries on this thing. If you use some funky non-standard size battery, I think a lot less people will replace them and you might actually increase the carbon impact overall. Also, I made it ridiculously easy to change the batteries on this thing, which I think is also a key input of design for repairability. If it's hard to get into this thing, like maybe iPhones, maybe people just don't deal with it or don't want to go through the effort. Also, 10 years is a long time in design. That's why it's really important to go with something timeless that's still gonna look good in a lot of years, just like me. Otherwise, people might stop using it even if it's not broken. Timeless. So we could even extend the lifetime if we look at the electronics a little bit more closely. So we can try different batteries like we use lithium iron phosphate. For that, we need a larger power bank because we need more batteries because less power dense. In the end, the carbon impact is pretty minimal. So in the end, I think sticking with standard lithium ion batteries and the smaller power bank seems like a good choice. So with a bit of playing around, we were able to bring down our potential carbon impact of our product by around 42% which is pretty good. It's also interesting to look at the strategies that worked out well on this product. For the power bank, it seemed like making it last as long as possible is the best way to lower the carbon impact. If you have to make less things, you're gonna make less impact. Any strategy to help that out, like design for repairability or durability or timelessness, is just gonna further lower the carbon impact because it's gonna keep this product in use as long as possible. Optimizing the enclosure had a bit of a lower impact in this case. I think that's mostly because the highest impact comes from the batteries and electronics. Product without electronics would probably have a much better result from optimizing optimizing in plastic. Wow, we got a pretty good design here. Can make music to this thing. Back to you in the studio. One tip I found out in this process is to double check the data you find. I found one research paper about power banks specifically and it caused me a lot of headache until I double checked and found out a lot of the information was kind of bogus. Like a month of work. So we were able to come up with a cool power bank design and also reduce the environmental impact. I would be really curious to hear about any of your experiences with life cycle assessment and design. Maybe in the future, I'll dive a bit further into some of these strategies. Who knows? I don't make a lot of videos, so. Well, I'll see you in the potential next one then. See you later. Bye.